to be with you again, friends. Thank you for your welcome. Um, I'm not quite sure what you s meant when you said you've seen it developing in me since I entered the building. Perhaps it meant you saw me writing some extra notes. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I tell you what, it's such a joy to t come to this building and to know we were coming to meet with you today. Um, you know the, two, the, the church right on the corner uh, where the traffic lights are just there? As we came around past there, I looked at the church and I thought, I'm so glad we're not meeting in one of those buildings, you know, <laughs> because my anticipation is with a building like that, A, it's cold, B, it's nearly empty, and three, you know it's got burning a hole in the pocket of the people that are still trying to meet there. And it is fantastic to come to meet in a building that's full of people praising God in the way that you do here. Thank you. The song that we were saying, prayer is the Lord, O oh my soul, or whatever it was, um, you know, the last time I sang that was with my extended family on Easter Sunday evening. I think there were 20 of us. And um, suddenly, <coughs> uh, the, I don't know whether it was for the two-year-old or the five-year-old, but somebody thought it was time to have a song, some songs on the television. That was one of the key ones that we were all joining in and our two-year-old bouncing up and down, two-year-old Dan Dixon, bouncing up and down, praising the Lord just as we were praising him. In fact, probably with a little bit more movement even than we were <laughs> praising him just now. Terrific, terrific. So I'm afraid I've got no con ju conjuring, juggling tricks today like you had last week. <laughs> I watched it online. <laughs> you, you give me... Two balls. I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> juggle those. Never mind five balls, <laughs> as we had last last week. Uh, no, no testament is from teenagers. Just a few stories from a, a septuagenarian. Um, I, I want to talk, if I may, please, a, a little bit about the characteristics of the children of God. Why? Well, I f uh, early uh, the start of the week, I found myself, you know, thinking and musing and praying, and into my mind came the verse about no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. So then I watched last week's service, and actually that's what Martin, amongst other things, was talking about, as he was talking about the encounter with um, the, the Lord that all the young people had had, and that what, he w what it was for, it was to equip them to be soldiers of Jesus Christ. And not just for now, but for lifelong and not just to be, may I say, pew fillers, as uh, churches often call their people who come to church every Sunday faithfully. What a terrible thing to say, just a pew filler. But actually the truth is, it's not about, a t it's not about how many a church sits, it's about how many a church sends. <laughs> and that's the issue for uh, all churches. How many people really live the Christian life 24-7 throughout the week, 12 months a year? being as vibrant with the life of the Spirit as the early church was. And I know that you as a people of God together as a church long for that and actually practice that as much as you can. Anyway, then I found myself <coughs> uh, uh, with a verse in my devotional, which is this verse here. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And let's say this together. And that is what we are. We are the children of the living God. What an incredible thought, friends, that once we're blind, now we can see. Once we were dead, now we're alive. Once we had no life, now we have life in him. Once we had no future, now the future is forever in his company. We are called the children of God, and that is what we are. Now, what is the significance of this? First thing is, look what it says here. It says, see, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We just sang a moment ago. This is not something that's seen with the eyes, physical eyes. This is seen with our spiritual eyes. And what an important difference that is, that this is something that actually comes by the grace of God, but it also comes to those who are asking for it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I, Paul says, I pray that he will open the eyes of your heart and they may see. And that's the prayer that we pray for each other. <coughs> but this is not just something that we pray for each other. This is something we're meant to, as it were, pray for ourselves or do for ourselves. Um, 
I found myself thinking about if you're, we're engaged in military service, how do we make ourselves strong in the Lord? You know, it says in, uh, about King David that he made himself strong in the Lord. It wasn't that he wasn't dependent on other people making him strong. He knew that he could himself make himself strong. So how is it that we can all individually make ourselves strong? And I found myself thinking a bit around that. Anybody? Oh. So identity, our identity is a very critical thing. Our sense of identity. Here's a, an interesting um, quote from a man called Tony Robbins, who I have no idea who he is, but apparently has written a book called Unlimited Power and another one called Awaken the Giant Within. I don't know whether he's a believer, but with titles of books like that, you'd have thought he might be, wouldn't you? But he's an American motivational speaker, probably making millions out of just talking. But whether he really knows the incredible power, the dynamic of the Holy Spirit within, I don't know. But what he says about ident identity is significant. Identity is this incredible invisible force that controls your whole life. It's invisible, like gravity is invisible, but it controls your whole life. What did we just say? We are called the children of God. Our identity is critical to our longevity as followers of Jesus and our vibrancy as followers of Jesus. Do you recognize this man? Steve Jobs. There's a young man that says that straight away. I realize that quite a few older people probably don't know of Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. This is what he says. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. What did your inner voice say just now? We are children of God. That is what we are. And yet it's extraordinary that Steve Jobs would be part of those who have developed iPhones, etc., the development of social media. What does social media do? Basically, social media confuses people's sense of identity. They are subject to the pressures of this world in all sorts of unimaginable to previous generations ways, such that they no longer who know, many young people, who they are. And that means that anything and everything defines them. And what they're defined by one day is different from what they're defined by another day. And so they live with this incredible angst of identity crisis. And one of the consequences of identity crisis is mental health. And we live in a pandemic of mental health issues in our society. So is it our genes that actually define us? Or our, uh, that, is, that is our nature? Or is it our upbringing that is nurture? Is it our education? Is it our job? Is it our wealth? Is it our success or lack of it? Is it our sexuality? Is it the social media's view of us? Whatever it is, if it's not our inner voice, then actually it's fluctuation to change, and in so doing, it means that we actually have no controlling power in us. In contrast, what are we? Children. The children of God. That is what we are. So we make ourselves strong by knowing our identity, by rehearsing our identity, by reflecting on our identity, and by living out our identity. So what is it that the children of God are really like, and how is it that we can live that out? That's basically what I'm speaking about, is I'm speaking about characteristics of the children of God. And so I, I find myself remembering that from this, ver um, sorry, this verse is in 1 John chapter 3, and uh, that it's actually from 1 John that I learned a number of verses when I first became a Christian. I was using the Navigator's Bible topical memory system and, you know, their credit card size bits of paper. On one side you have the, the, the address, like 1 John 3 verse 8, and on the other side you have who lives at the address. 1 John 3 verse 8. Hmm. Perhaps we should have the Bible memory system. <laughs> it was great, incidentally, doing that Bible memory verse just now. That is what makes you strong. It makes you understand your identity. 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Absolutely. Uh, 1 John 5, verse 11 or 12, I can't quite remember which of those two it is. What lives there? God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. Who, he who has the Son has life. 1 John 1, verse 9. Yes, yes, if we confess our sins, 
God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all. You're good, you're good, you're good. That's it. That's what makes you strong, isn't it? Now, that is a key thing to what makes us strong. And the repetition of it, of course, uh, is helped nowadays a lot by song. And um, it's interesting that one of the favorite songs today is about identity. Well, I could have gone on singing that for a long time, couldn't we? <laughs> so, what do children of God do? What is it that bubbles up within them and flows out from them, from that assurance? Here, here are some things. It's, it's a little bit of a list. It's only 25. No, 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 it's nothing like that many. <laughs> <laughs> but they come from 1 John, um, and uh, which actually separates us many of these things from those who have no sense of identity in our world today. So here's the first one. Joyful gratitude. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Each of us can know that we're infinitely loved as a child of God. Whatever our background, whatever our position in society, whatever our wealth, Whatever nationality, we can know ourselves, beloved, beloved children of God. Mm. Loved as if we were the only one in the world that had ever fallen short of the glory of God, sinned and turned our backs on him. If I were the only one, my Lord Jesus would still have come to this planet Earth for me. This is the extent of his love for us. This is what it says in 1 John 4, verse 9. This is how God showed his love for us, through sending his son for us that we might live in him or through him. You know, that, that came home to me very, very powerfully um, soon after my heart attack and cardiac arrest uh, uh, back in 2006, the end of. Um, it, it, the circumstances were, you know, demonstrative of the fact that God has his hand on us and God has had his hand on me. The paramedics had arrived by the time I had my cardiac arrest. So uh, that was as a result partly of the sensitivity of my w daughter to knowing that so I was seriously ill, whereas I didn't think very much was wrong with me. Um, <laughs> men and uh, awareness of what's happening in their bodies, not great, those two th combinations <laughs> together. Anyway, she rang up, the me medics arrived, the night before, my wife had had a dream where the Lord told her she'd have to pray as she'd never prayed in her life before. And so she, f she was immediately, when she returned to the house, because she wasn't in the house when the paramedics arrived, uh, she started praying. I had my cardiac arrest. She kept praying. Anyway, what after that, uh, as I was recovering, I had a stent put in. and Praise God, I'm still here 16 years later. Um, so it has to be more than that now, isn't it? Uh, so... When you've had a, um, a, 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 some blockage to your blood supply to your brain, it's quite hard to put your words together again afterwards. So somebody with a stroke finds it difficult to talk, for instance. That, that's basically what happens when the blood supply stops to your brain. So I, I was finding it difficult to pray uh, verbally. 
what, you know, what, what do you pray? How do you pray if you can't put words together? And um, in I was also finding it hard to go to sleep at night. Um, so some of the most profound times of knowing the presence of the Lord and his love for me was when I was reduced in that time to saying simply, Father, thank you that you love me. I love you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Get back to simplicity, friends, to the heart of it all. Uh, interestingly, uh, a few weeks ago, um, Anne was listening to a podcast from Bill Johnson, and he used this little phrase, stir up your affection for the Lord. And he talked about uh, how at night sometimes he's having difficulty sleeping. And at the, in those moments, when you know at night when all the sort of worries can surface and keep you awake if you're not careful and you wonder how things are going to turn out, he says what he finds, the antidote for to that, is stirring up his affections for the Lord. And I realized that it, I, wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have described it like that those years back when I found myself in the middle of the night praying simply, Father, thank you that you love me, I love you. Suddenly I got a handle on what I was actually doing at that time. It was stirring up my affection for the Lord who is affectionate towards me. And I commend that to you. See what great love the Father has lavished on you. It was an interesting thing, you know, is that um, one of the most popular songs in the UK at one stage was that harvest song, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above, so thank the Lord, thank the Lord for all his love. And, um, you know, that was, uh, maybe, maybe that, that and... Uh, we don't celebrate harvest quite in the same way, but actually it's quite interesting the impact on giving, of giving thanks has on people. So even people without a very personal faith talk about, you know, if you can give thanks for a number of things every day of your life, it will make you a different person. Now, as a Christian, how many things have we got to give God thanks for every day of our life? Uh, uh, and every other Friday, we visit Anne's mother, who li still lives in Salisbury, where she's been uh, living for the last 38 years or something like that, 36 of them as a widow. And, um, you know, it's quite hard when you've been happily married, as she was for many years, uh, serving the Lord together with her husband, who also was uh, an ordained ang Anglican minister. And um, then so she had to sort of redefine herself as a single person, and find out why the Lord had left her on planet Earth, but not her husband. And so she served the Lord in all sorts of different ways in Salisbury. But at 99 next month, her body is beginning to run out of energy. And she's thinking, I'd rather be at home with the Lord. <laughs> and at times she gets a little bit in the home in which she's now living, in a, the career care home, depressed. It is extraordinary what happens when we say, sometimes towards the end, perhaps we should do this at the beginning of our visits in the future, and I'm thinking, uh, let's pray together, which she always wants to do. So when we pray together, as soon as we start giving thanks for something, whatever that thing is, she is immediately tuned in to giving thanks. And sometimes she, she kicks off in giving thanks. By the time we've finished giving thanks, actually, she hasn't had to pray for very much, but her mood is extraordinarily changed. That is the consequence of recognizing and stirring up deliberate, deliberately our awareness of how God has lavished his love upon us in all sorts of different ways. Joyful gratitude. Next thing I'm going to say is humble assurance. The whole reason why John wrote his letters is given here in 1 John 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is no doubt whatsoever, as I've already referenced from another text, that, uh, the previous verse that I said, he who has the Son has life. If you have responded to Jesus Christ, you have the life of God living within you. You have eternal life. It's interesting, though, that he has to write this. They already had this, the, the, the Spirit of God living in them. But he wrote it to reinforce their identity because the enemy will constantly attack us and try, particularly in the early years of our Christian uh, commitment to Christ, he will try to undermine, um, uh, un undermine us. You do that and you call yourself a Christian? If you have the Son, you have life. 
you may not yet be what one day you will be. In fact, you're certainly not yet what one day you will be. <laughs> and if you doubt it, just ask the, your closest friend or your spouse. They will tell you, my goodness, if you don't change something further, you're not fit for heaven still. You know, and it's, None of us are fit for heaven. But we have the sun, so we have life. And we're in the process of change. That's a slow process for some of us. Bear with us, please. <laughs> the Lord hasn't finished with us yet. Um, I, I, was, uh, I, I went to see J, J. John this week, and um, I haven't seen him for quite a long time. Do you know J. John? You know, he's a North London boy, um, great evangelist. Uh, and he was saying to me that I can't remember how I made, made – I just referenced being born again. Uh, and I can't quite remember why I referenced that in the conversation. Oh, you know, I was the way he was. Oh, you know, I was talking to somebody just this week. Um, had had lunch with somebody or dinner with somebody, and um, I said to him, "Are you born again?" You know, that's what evangelists do. No beating about the bush. Are you born again? It's a great question, isn't it? Anyway, he said, "Born again? What do you mean?" I said, "Well, Jesus talked about being born again." He said, "No, Jesus didn't. That comes from Volkswagen, not Jesus." <laughs> Anyway, so then J. John turns into the scripture and says, you must be born again. And then they move away from the table where the others are around the table, sit on the couch. He said, before long, I led him to faith in Jesus. You pray the prayer. And immediately he was born again. He said, my, I feel completely different. Now, not everybody has that immediate feeling of difference. But actually, once you've received Jesus, you are completely different. You have life. That means the door of heaven is open for you. And it will not be closed. You have been born again. And that is something that we can be sure about, but we are humbly sure of it. Because it's not something that by our own merits we deserve or achieve. It's something that's just given to us by the grace of God. A couple of years after I received Jesus as my Savior, I was at a family uh, wedding, and I was wheeling my arthritically bound uh, wheelchair, sorry, arthritic wheelchair-bound great aunt, a single woman, uh, into the reception. And suddenly, out of the blue, she turned around and said, John, you know, I've been praying for you every day of your life since you were born. <laughs> now, in, in my understanding, I didn't know of anybody else in my family who'd been born again. Um, we were so, sort of middle class, education is the salvation of humanity rather than Jesus is the salvation of humanity <laughs> uh, type of family. And so to have a, a, a relative turn around and say they've been praying for, I, I was sometimes wondering, how, why me, Lord? <coughs> how come I've become a Christian? Suddenly it was apparent to me it's the grace of God, and yet we have to respond to the grace of God. But once we've responded, we can have that humble assurance we have life. Uh, next thing, a, a growing purity. I, I've already referenced this a, a little bit. If we claim to be without sin, this is written to Christians. This isn't descriptive of people who are not yet but followers of Jesus. If we, those who love and follow Jesus, have received him, have received life, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But then that glorious text that follows it, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness or kinds of wrongdoing. Now, one of the easiest things to do as a, a, somebody that's been a follower of Jesus for a long time is to be self-deceived or to deceive others that actually everything's okay when it's not. So the practice of confession is actually a significant thing. I'm, I'm not going to say, uh, uh, now, now is the time where I'm going to leave five minutes for you to look inside your heart and think of all the terrible things that you've said, done, or thought over the last week, and then we're going to have a public confession of those in front of one another. But there is something about when the Holy Spirit comes that people actually begin to see themselves, guess what? as God sees them. And that means that they exposes to their hearts and their minds things that have been hidden. So in 1 John, it talks a lot about walking in the light. 
That means not deceiving yourself or allowing the enemy to deceive you, and it means not seeking to deceive others. And we live now at the moment in a, in a culture where the church is in disrepute in the world's eyes because of the deceitfulness of various high-profile Christian leaders. And we're not talking about a, a traditional church here. We're talking about born-again followers of Jesus Christ, churches sensitive to the movement of the Spirit of God, but which, for one reason or another, the leaders of which have now begu had begun to live behind a wall, and the wall is deceit. They've deceived themselves, and they've deceived those who are in their churches, and that is being exposed by the Spirit of God at the moment. But it's a great pain to those people's families and to those people's churches, or in some cases to the movements that those people founded. And we're in relationship personally, although it's now a very distant relationship. I met for a number of years with two leaders who became well-known in the Anglican Christian charismatic world who ended up having affairs. And I, we are also in relationship, and this is a closer relationship that we still have with lots of people who've been affected, very affected, as by the revelations around Soul for the Survivor that have been going on in the last two years. All because of we're unaware to handle the, the need to take these verses seriously. Pretending that everything's all right when it's not, and deceiving other people by a pretense of it's all all right. So it, here's a really important thing, friends. If you want to be strong and have the I am a child of God going through every pore of your life, then find a soulmate that you can talk to about real things, not just a church friend that you have to smile at on Sundays and say, when they say, how are you? You say, oh, all right, thank you. We've got to get beyond that if we're really to exhibit the true nature of the children of God. So, um, yeah. Next one. How are you doing? Okay. Yeah. Now, next one. There's a sensitivity to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. I could have used that, actually, under my last heading because it is the Holy Spirit who both shows us what's wrong and then uh, uh, brings God's antidote to that. Um, but I want to talk about sensitivity to the Holy Spirit under this text. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He's given us his spirit because actually each of us needs to stir up continuously a sensitivity to the spirit. Um, I know one of the things that uh, Martin was rejoicing in over last week was the way in which numbers of young people were released in the gift of tongues. Praise God. <laughs> Wonderful thing. Now, here's a question. How many of you were, re were released in the gift of tongues but don't use it every day? Now, you don't have to answer it publicly. It's all right. <laughs> but why not? If that is the case, why not? Now, this is what I'm ta we're talking about here. We know that the Spirit of God lives in us because of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So our, how, what life of the Spirit are you actually deliberately fostering and fueling day by day, on your own. And if you pray in tongues, I would say that's a really significant way to be exhibit that or and to, and to strengthen your own self in God. So Jackie Pullinger, when she was released in tongues, was told, well, now you've got to pray 10 minutes a day in tongues every day. Why did she become the woman of God, the warrior for God, that she became just changing the life of the walled city in, of Hong Kong? Well, partly because she'd made herself strong in the Lord by doing that constantly praying in the Spirit. Now, how else can you make yourself strong in the Spirit? L listen to Holy Spirit stories. <laughs> uh, that means in church you tell Holy Spirit stories, and then you remember Holy Spirit stories. And the way you remember Holy Spirit stories is actually by telling Holy Spirit stories. Mm -hmm. So when there's a good testimony, remember it and try and tell it to somebody fairly immediately, and then you will remember that Holy Spirit story. Now, here is a Holy Spirit story that was told in our church, Christ Church Barnet, uh, on Easter Sunday, 10 days ago, the like of which probably happens all the time here. But, you know, it was, this was a 73-year-old man giving a testimony. And the testimony is of how he's come to real living faith in Jesus. He's been part of the church for just two years. So he's talked about uh, his early days when he was um, a teenager from a, a not-church-attending background, but went to a beach mission um, in Devon. 
where he was living. And at the beach mission, um, he prayed a prayer to receive Jesus when he was 15 years old. And he said as he did that, when he'd done that, there was a tangible feeling within him that he actually was in touch with God. God was in touch with him. He then said that he made all sorts of choices, which meant that he no longer followed Jesus. And now here he was, we referenced two years uh, ago, when he went into um, when he went to the hairdresser, talked to the hairdresser about uh, the barber about not being at all well, and the barber put his hand on his shoulder and said, "You should try praying." And he said at that moment, he had exactly the same sense of the tangible presence of God as he had when he was a 15-year-old, and that was 58 years earlier. Isn't that an amazing thing? The Spirit of God had not left him, even though he'd left following the Spirit of God. So that when a Spirit-filled believer put his hand on his shoulder and said, try praying, God made himself known to him again. Now he's got all sorts of issues in his life that he's trying to sort out now, having made some choices that he would not have made had he been following Jesus for those years. But he's been in the Alpha course. He's now in the Discovery Bible group course. And he's, uh, he, you know, almost, uh, after almost every sermon on a Sunday, he will walk up to the preacher and ask the preacher questions about this and this because he has been so touched by what's been said. And significant prayer ministry changing some of his attitudes, setting him, setting him free from some things. That's, a, to me, a Holy Spirit story. Yeah. I want people to remember a story like that. I want people to repeat stories like that because as they do so, they're aware of the power of the Spirit of God. And that's what this is about. But it's not just in dramatic things like that. So I think, uh, on, on just on another personal level, what's the Spirit of God been prompting you to do recently? What's he been saying to you? What has he been prompting you to do or say to others? You've probably all got stories about that, but actually identifying them as Holy Spirit stuff, maybe you don't often do that. So here's something that I suddenly realized. That must have been a Holy Spirit moment. Um, so coming off the tube on Wednesday um, at Arnos Grove tube station, Anne and I had a wonderful day down at the morning at the British Museum. Uh, we, we very rarely visited the British Museum, but we'd been told about a... By the, the, the uh, archaeology and the Bible tour that um, a man takes. He, he's, an, he's an individual, but you know you, you know you pay him, but uh, and I suppose he's you know they, they license him to do that. And he's uh, he's the son of a pastor, a Brazilian, and he's fantastic. And so he took us to all the parts in the British Museum, you know, the Egyptian part, and, and then there are bits where there's parts of the Babylonian history and then the Assyrian Empire history, all of which. Uh, evidence for you know <coughs> when they lived, how they lived, what they did to the Jews um, is there in archaeology. So referencing the Bible in all sorts of places. It was a really exciting. Anyway, we came we came back really quite buzzing. And you know, at getting off the tube at at, uh, at Arnold's Grove, there was a young woman with a pram and two little children. One of which was in the pram, and the other which was walking, who were about the same as our grandchildren's age. I, I realised. So I said to her, "Can I help you up the steps?" Um, with this, and so you know, I took one side of the thing, she took the other side, and as we went up, I realized she wasn't English, and I said, so where are you from? She said, Colombia. I said, oh, that's so interesting. You've got a Colombian son-in-law. And we had quite an, a, a, a conversation for five minutes about what living in England is like, how she likes New Southgate. I said to her, well, you know, my Colombian son-in-law would love to meet other Colombians as well. They live just around the corner from you. So we agreed that in the summer, we would um, have a barbecue together. I said, well, have you got a garden? She said, no. I said, well, we've got a garden. She said, in that case, we'll provide the food. So, you know, that's... A, and I thought afterwards, that's a little Holy Spirit moment, isn't it? Now, things like that, when we get in touch with those as Holy Spirit moments, it gives us the confidence to say, I am a child of God. So get in touch with the Holy Spirit moments in your own personal life. You know, there are Holy Spirit moments in a church's life as well. I was interested in the notices. Notices? Anything interesting in notices? We're, we're going on a prayer walk. Isn't that what you said? Something like that? Do you know, prayer walking is becoming quite a thing in the church at the moment. Um, I don't know whether you know of a chap called David Vincent who's involved in the prayer. He's, he's determined that every street of Barnet should be prayer walked before Pentecost, is it? I kind of, something like that. And he's setting up <coughs> Uh, and I'm going to a meeting about it this week. 
to try to encourage church leaders to take on the prayer walks in their neighborhood. I think that's happening a lot around the country at the moment. Prayer generally, prayer meetings are making a comeback. Amen. Thanks be to God for Zoom. Amen. So St. Barnabas Church, where I was vicar, you know, that they apparently beginning of the year, they've got a new vicar now, uh, two, two since I left. Um, and um, the new vicar, who came in July last year, said, we're going to start the new year with 40 days of prayer. On Zoom, 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> they had 50 people. A at the end of the month, there were still 35, regularly. He said, okay, we're going to go for 100 days now. So ke they kept going for 100 days. I think the 100 days must be over now. Is that right? Would 100 days since the uh, beginning of the year be over? Just about, aren't they? They're going to continue. One of them joins from Turkey. Another one, you know, that's not all local people even. But I believe that actually there are many more Zoom prayer meetings now than people were, and people at the Zoom prayer meetings than there were prior to lockdown. Yeah. God is able to bring something even out of a desert and wilderness time, a new stream, a new pathway for the church. These are Holy Spirit things. Uh, things, friends. Let's join in with what the Spirit is doing. When we're joining in with what the Spirit is already doing, life gets m much more exciting. Amen. Now, it's time I finished. How, ma uh, how many more things can I say before I finish? I'm looking to my wife. <laughs> Very quickly, another thing from 1 John. We know that we have passed from death to life. You know, that gives us the assurance because we love each other. Dear children, let's not love with words and speech, but with actions and in truth. Actually, it talks in this same passage about if one of you sees another in need, then give to them. I had a, a, a um, person that was working for us part-time um, in the admin side of St. Bees at one stage who came from a fairly poor background. She was wanting to stay. She was a single mother at this stage. She didn't want to work full-time because she was still raising school-aged children. And we, we paid her what we could, but it wasn't, a, you know, full living wage. And um, she would talk with her uh, extended family who weren't believers in Jesus, and they would be surprised about her faith on the one hand and think she ought to be getting a better paid job than she had on the other hand. One Christmas, she went back in a relatively new car. How did you get that car on your salary? Somebody in the church gave it to me, she said. She said it was the most incredible a conversation opening thing that she's ever had in terms of telling other people about what it really means to follow Jesus. That's infectious generosity, friends. But it doesn't have to be on big things. Anne, in a sermon the other day at CCB, referenced um, a book called uh, The Gospel Comes with a Latch Key by a woman in America. It's about hospitality. Basically, if, you, if you're hospitable, just inviting people into your home and feeding them, actually it, changed people's, it changes people's hearts. So th th this, uh, there was a woman who wrote the book who was a, a, an arch lesbian and trans person, a university lecturer, speaking about LGB, uh, et cetera, rights. And um, she wrote a very vitriolic article in a Christian magazine. And this Christian pastor and his wife got in touch with her and said, would you like to come around for supper? She went around for supper for two years every week because she just was not threatened by them. They didn't try to pers persuade her to change her mind. She realized actually they weren't as bad as the Aunt Sally's that she had painted in her articles and then thrown mud at and shot. And uh, after two years, she gave her life to Jesus. Amen. Infectious generosity, friends. Uh, freely you receive, freely give. That's what a child of God does. It's amazing the power of that. Last little point here, and Ms. Dan's going to come and, and say something on this as well. We have an undefeatable hope. When Christ appears. Amen. Not if. What did I say? When, when Christ appears. Amen. We don't know the future. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> when Christ appears. There's not a doubt about this. The longer you wait, the sooner he'll arrive. <laughs> when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Whoa. For we shall see him as he is.
What hope do you have in your life for all the things that you've battled with? Do you fear that you'll have to battle with them forever and eternity long? You won't. For when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And the reason the Son of God appeared in the first place and will appear to complete his work is to destroy all the devil's work. Um, Anne, will you like to come up? Yeah, I think we may have introduced our, our granddaughter to you before. Have we introduced our uh, granddaughter to you before? I don't know whether we've played this little video to you before. I think she's this last year. She uh, is at this stage four. Um, and she, she w enjoys uh, music while she's eating, uh, while she's doing anything, actually. <laughs> she can hear. She, she's lost a third of her brain at birth. She can't see. She's totally blind. She's got all sorts of motor issues, and um, she can't really s communicate very much, except she can respond. Um, and uh, she was listening to that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let's, let's just try, try playing that one. I don't think that's a sort of children's song, but um, our son and his wife have surrounded her with um, worship music ever since she was born. Bella lost a third of her brain, and, well, her brain had leaked out of her head. So she doesn't have a normal brain. She has, that's why she has a small head. Um, she doesn't, the brain that was left uh, was not normal. So um, she doesn't have brain power. Partly she doesn't have brain, and what was left is not uh, a normal functioning brain. So we said to the um, consultants, well, what can we expect? And they said, well, the brain actually controls everything. So you can't expect anything. I mean, the brain does actually control how we use our body as well as our understanding. <coughs> and um, so anything that she achieves is to us a miracle. <laughs> so if you met her, you might think, oh, poor little thing, she can't do very much because she can't walk, she can't stand even, she can sit. That's a miracle. <laughs> um, she can't feed herself, but she can swallow. That's a miracle. <laughs> anyway, um, you know the verse, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And um, she doesn't have very much mind, She's been showing us, she's now five. Uh, I think this is when she was about th four. Um, that although her mind is, you know, defective, really, her understanding is defective, actually her spirit is all there. And she loves the Lord. And although, as John says, she responds to us, that's a bit of a, a miracle because she responds to us talking to her, um, 
so she's got some understanding there. She doesn't very often um, initiate conversation. So when she started to sing this song, and if when she says, you know, I want to sing, and we'll say, what do you want to sing? Do you want to sing It's Well With My Soul? She'll go, yeah. Um, it's almost like her singing part is telling us that it is well with her soul. Um, and I just want to uh, reassure any of you who have relatives or friends or <laughs> even yourself, if you're thinking, my mind is going. It's my mother who's 99. She's worried that, you know, her brain is not working as fast as it did. Your soul is very different. And your soul can be right there. And um, Bella is making herself strong in the Lord. So what we have, John and I have always done as we've looked after her, is we've prayed over her. And she responds really positively to prayer. I mean, one of her words is more. So um, we pray, and if we stop, she just says more. Yeah. And it's quite difficult to keep praying. <laughs> so we pray in tongues. And um, she can go on for ages. And, and what she wants us to do, interestingly, she'll sit on our lap and she'll put her head right underneath your voice praying in tongues. It's almost like she's praying for <laughs> healing in her head. I don't know what's going on in her head. Anyway, when she realizes that John and I have come into the room with her, she'll suddenly go, ah, la, 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 because she prays in tongues herself, actually quite confidently, interestingly, Praying in tongues is a different language from the language that we've learnt, either from our parents or, you know, as babies, or learnt in school. So she's quite confident, she's not confident in that, but she's quite confident in praying in tongues. And she wants us to pray in tongues all the time. So you walk into the, we're walking to the park with her, you'll find that we're there singing in tongues as we're walking along. I don't know what everybody makes of it, but anyway. Um, and she's on the swing. She's singing in tongues as <laughs> with us because she's making herself strong in the Lord. And uh, I'm thrilled to hear that you were praying with those young people that they would be released in the gift of tongues because our teenagers, are they're not here, are they? Those wonderful teenagers um, they really need to be strong in the Lord in this generation because this, the culture we're bringing them up in is so confusing and confused and so adverse to everything that we hold dear from what we've learned as the children of God. But that is true for us too. We live in that culture. We need to be strong in the Lord. And um, so I think what I'm just going to finish with, if this is all right, is just to echo what John was saying about if you've been released in tongues, we need to be praying in it all the time. We need to be praying it as we walk the streets, prayer walking. We need to be praying over our children. We need to be praying whenever you have a, you know, just a dawdle moment, waiting in the surgery or at the bus stop, or I don't expect you have too many dawdle moments, but, you know, we need to be praying in tongues because that strengthens our spirits. And our spirits are what is going to be part and passing into the eternity that we've been talking about. If you haven't been released, you will be a bit like me. I mean, I was a Christian for years and years and years. And I was even a vicar's wife. And I never prayed in tongues. Um, and uh, then finally, I realized it was important and I thought, well, maybe it's not for me because I'm a language teacher and, you know, I do language in a different way. That was just pride. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a language to do with our head. 
is a language to do with our spirit. And when we are born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. So anybody with the Holy Spirit in us can speak in the Holy Spirit language in us. The Holy Spirit is not mute. The Holy Spirit has not lost his voice in you if you haven't released it yet. It's just that you haven't made the sound yet. And um, what I think is babies just automatically learn to speak because they are born into a speaking culture. Maybe it's the family or the people around them. And sometimes we just learn to speak in the spirit when we are born into a speaking culture. This is God's culture here in the church. And we pray in tongues. And we pray in the spirit because it's strengthening us and because the spirit prays things that we don't really know what to pray for. Frankly, I don't always know how to pray. So uh, I have to let the Holy Spirit pray through me. And then sometimes as I pray in the Spirit, I suddenly realize I need to pray this. And I pray in my own language, English. And then I run out of that. When I was praying for John as he was going through his heart attack um, operation, you know, it went on for hours, it seemed, um, and I was pacing up and down the uh, hospital corridor, and they have to do it when you're very <coughs> cold, apparently. So uh, they do it in the basement of the hospital, uh, heart stuff, and they don't have any heating on. Oh, I hate being cold. But, <laughs> you know, if I hadn't been able to pray in the spirit, I would have been thinking, oh, God, I'm cold, <laughs> and I want my husband back. <sighs> now what do I pray? I'm just cold. You know, I could march up and down that corridor praying in tongues because I didn't have to have my understanding. I'm cold, I'm miserable, and I'm also not sure about the future. I, have to, I could turn that off, and I turned the spirit on. So what I'm going to suggest that we do, uh, because I guess there are some of us who haven't yet released the gift of tongues, and we all need it. Each of us needs it to strengthen ourselves, to, to, to bring life wherever we walk. I'm going to suggest that we all stand up and we just pray in tongues. And then if you haven't released it, uh, I'm, if you pray in tongues, I'm going to suggest that you pray quite loud because then you will mask those who haven't been released yet. Uh, because uh, if you're anything like me, you think, mm. I don't know whether I can do this, and I will look a fool, and I'm an adult now, and I don't want to look as if I'm stupid. It will feel like that. Just let me remind you, it does feel like that to start with. So let's give people grace and time as well. You will have to make a sound with your mouth. Start, if you're not sure how to do that, just think muttering. I mean, actually, praying in tongues very often does sound a bit like muttering. One of, one of my friends used to call it uh, knitting needles because it sounds like a whole lot of knitting needles, needles clacking. Well, just let your tongue go and give it to the Lord so that you can pray with your spirit. You won't understand it, <coughs> but you will be blessing the Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are a spirit who speaks and you speak through us. And I pray now that you would release the tongues of those who haven't been released yet. Let's all start praying out loud in tongues. And if you haven't yet prayed in tongues, just give your tongue to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to make a sound for you, even if it sounds silly. And it's just one sound. That's how people start. Sometimes people start with the whole language. Sometimes they just start with one or two sounds. That's okay. Either way, you will be starting on that language. We praise you and 
we praise you. We praise you and glorify your name, Lord. We see you in your glory. We love your glory, Lord. If you haven't been released yet, shut your eyes because you will hear better. Shut your eyes. Like Bella, she's blind, but she hears really well. Listen to the people around you and start making those sounds. You are lovely. You are lovely, Lord. You are wonderful. You are wonderful, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We welcome you wherever we are. We welcome you to come in. This is your earth. This is your creation. These are your people. They have been stolen and we will not have it, Lord. Open the gates, Jesus. Open the gates. You've given us the keys. We unlock the gates. The people that we are going to meet this week, the people we're walking past, the people that we're living with, Jesus, open the gates that they would come in, that they would find life. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory in the church. Glory in the church. Glory in the church. Thank you, Jesus. You are glory in the church. This is your glory in the church. Open our eyes, Jesus, as we've been singing. Open your eyes of our hearts to see you at work and to praise you for that and to encourage that. Um, I just want, uh, I want us to pray, uh, really, that we will see wherever the Lord is at work. When I came into this church, I saw the Lord at work in that little boy running round and round and round. You know, it reminded me of when the Holy Spirit's at work in adults. I've seen this happen. Energy is released, and sometimes they even start running. You know, some of our children, they haven't got the sort of linguistic hold that we've got, but they have got energy. And when we're singing worship to the Lord, they just want to run. Let them run. I mean, let them be safe. Let them run safely, but let them run. Because it's like a sign of the Holy Spirit amongst us. The children are, are just manifesting the Holy Spirit. The teenagers are manifesting the Holy Spirit. Let's not get behind them, adults. Come on, let's lead the way. Let's lead the way. Uh, and I just want to say, for those of you who have been released in tongues this morning and all you did was go, la, la, or something like that, very tentatively, there is a party in heaven over that because the Lord is releasing his spirit in you. So don't underestimate it. Just keep practicing it. And more will come. More will come. And maybe... We're going to hand over and because is there a song that we can sing to give thanks to the Lord? Right, stay on your feet, please. Stay in an attitude of, of, of prayer and worship.